very exciting to be here. I don't live in New York, or I would volunteer immediately to mentor eight young female writers. Um, it's, it's such a cool program. It's such a, it's such a great thing. And I'm, I'm so grateful to Maude for that introduction, which I hope I can live up to and probably um, can't. Um, <laughs> um, and, and I'm grateful to Maude for inviting me to come and introduce the last readers of the year and to talk a little bit about um, my own writing and my own experiences as a young writer. I found myself at 16, um, far away from home, thousands of miles away from home, working for room and board. I was going to, a, I got myself a scholarship to a private school. I grew up in Arizona. And I sort of got myself out of Arizona and, and got myself to a Waldorf school. But I had to get a scholarship because we didn't have any money. And I had to work for room and board. And I was very much the outsider at the beginning there. I didn't know anyone. And they'd all been together since kindergarten. And so I was really lonely. And so I discovered, I'd, I'd, I'd always written all my life. But I really started writing then. I, I really started writing far from home. And my mother, of course, had been my earliest reader, and I suppose mentor, but she was my mother. So she was guaranteed and contractually obligated to love everything I wrote. Um, my, my, one of my English teachers was this fierce woman with a speech impediment named May, May Elliott. And she ruled her class with a literary um, cattle prod. She, she was, <laughs> she was T.S. Eliot's niece, although she never talked about it. We all knew, and we all were, were suitably impressed. And she was brilliant, and, and she loved me, and she loved my writing, and she took an interest in me at a time when I was just sitting alone at recess writing in my journals and sitting alone at, at lunch, just writing and writing. She had us write fiction, she had us read, she had us write essays. And she encouraged my fiction because I'd been doing it all my life. But I didn't know how to write an essay. And one day she marched up to me in class and handed me an essay I had written on, I think it was Emerson. And she said to me, Katie Christensen, I know you're capable of writing an essay. This isn't it. Go home. <laughs> so I did. And I loved her. And I loved her and I respected her. Um, so, so she was my mentor. She, she really, um, I had her for two years. I graduated from high school. I said goodbye to her and, and didn't expect to see her again. When my third novel came out, I was reading upstate, because it takes place upstate, um, in upstate New York, which is, it was sort of near where my school was. I was, I was in the middle of my reading, all caught up in, in my novel, and I looked up, and there was Mae Elliott in the audience. And I stopped reading, and I put my book down, and I said, Mae Elliott, is that you? <laughs> And she looked just horrified that I would <laughs> stop reading. And, and she, I, I, I can't really remember her response, but it was something like, you're doing fine, keep reading. God, don't stop. <laughs> so that was a, a, a real thrill. I was, I, was, I was just soaring for the rest of the reading, thinking May Elliot is listening to my published words. And it, at the end of the reading, she came up and she said, that was pretty good. <laughs> and I, of course, was, was thrilled all over again. And so having a mentor meant so much to me at a time when I had no audience for my writing and I had no one really else in my life to, to sort of to, to write for. And it's so important to have someone to give you feedback instantly and take you seriously as a writer when you're a teenage girl without a lot of power in the world and without a lot of sort of outlets um, for, for writing. And I, I, I hope, you know, I hope everyone gets to have that moment where you look up and there's your mentor when you're, you're giving a reading from your third published book. It's absolutely wonderful. So Maude told you a bit about the fact that I write from a male perspective. And I, I feel that I got that from May Elliott too, because she talked a lot about the authenticity of imagination, which sounds very fancy. But I think what she meant, in fact, I know what she meant because she explained it was that you can be anyone you want in writing. You're not bound by being a 16-year-old girl sitting <laughs> who, who feels overweight and has a bad perm and doesn't have a boyfriend. You don't have to be that when you're writing. You, you can actually be anybody you want. You can go to outer space, and, and you can go back in time or forward in time. You're, not, you're free as a writer to do whatever you want and be whomever you want. In the case of the astral, I projected myself into the psyche of a 57-year-old man, which, which I'm not, 
And I wrote about a building, which is the Astral Apartment Building, which is, this isn't the book, this is the galley, but it's, a, it's on the cover of the book also, is a photograph of the actual building, a, a building I've, I've never been inside. So I made up the building and I made up the guy, and I became a guy who lived in the Astral and had been kicked out by his wife. I'm going to read a short section because um, I'm so excited to hear everyone else read. I don't want to go on and on. <coughs> in this section, <coughs> sorry, Harry Quirk <coughs> gets in a fight, lusts after young Polish girls, and gets arrested. And I've never done any of those things. <coughs> I'm going to push this. I always get a frog in my throat right at the beginning. <coughs> It's like China, there's a water shortage. <laughs> okay, let me see if I can find it. All right, this is the beginning of chapter four, and there's a description of the building. Now I've just told you everything that's gonna happen. Can you all hear me? Yeah. Okay. Midway down the block, the astral apartments came into view, an enormous six-story red brick tenement castle fortress that spanned a whole block of Franklin between India and Java. The place was compelling to look at from without, lighted from within. Great rock-faced brownstone arches curved over the entryways. Above them, windows were set into recessed arches that rose to the fifth floor of the facade, and above these were crenellated, decorated rooftop embellishments. Three-sided bay windows were festooned ghetto-like with webbed metal gates, stubbled with air conditioners, made fancy-looking with decorative brickwork and lintels. The building's huge corners were rounded and tower-like. No opportunity to decorate had been wasted. Even the structural steel storefronts on the first floor, housing a cafe and a laundromat, were gussied up by their own rivets. The place had been built by Charles Pratt in the late 1880s to house his astral oil kerosene factory workers. Astral oil's slogan had been, the holy lamps of Tibet are primed with astral oil, to which they might have appended, and the refineries of astral oil are primed with cheap labor. Some claim that Mae West had been born in this building. I didn't see why that couldn't have been so. As soon as I saw the place, I changed my mind about going home. In order to get into my own apartment, I would have had to bribe the super, since my wife had no doubt changed the locks on me, and I couldn't afford to bribe anyone. And I had lost interest in sneaking into my longtime home to look into my own refrigerator and rustle up some breakfast and sit in my old chair and take a shower which had been my original, if vague, intent. Seeing Luz walk away from me in tears like that had filled me with a furious itch to do something worthy of her disapprobation and mistrust. My anger was tempered with the kind of nausea that demanded palliative action. If she was going to vilify me, then I would goddamn well give her a reason to. No reason to be all sad sack about things. I needed to find a woman, any woman, to justify all of this. I walked back up to Manhattan Avenue where all the public clocks were stopped at some arbitrary hour. I stomped along until I came to the donut shop and saw their window full of freshly made donuts, real donuts, and saw the Polish girls behind the counter handing wax paper bags and change to customers. I went in and took a seat at the counter. Chocolate cake donut and a cruller, I said to the luscious, sultry lass who approached me inquisitively. Coffee with milk and sugar. She brought it all without expression. I ogled her as she refilled the cup of the guy next to me, a beefy Polish gentleman who smelled of last night's vodka binge and who had a head like a boulder. His eyes were of a blue so pale they had almost no color at all. His hair so blonde it was likewise almost colorless was buzzed over his scalp. His big round head was set into bricklayer's shoulders, a torso like the back of an armchair. I knew all this because I turned to look at him to ascertain why he was looking at me. He did not appear to like what he saw. We had a brief silent stare down. Beautiful day, I said, biting into my crawler. He didn't answer. I turned my attention back to the girl who was now slouching by the cash register looking at nothing. She wore the expression of so many of the Polsky lasses, that contemptuous, flat, blasé look that warned all comers that she had heard it before and hadn't cared for it much the first 27 times. An old photographer friend of Marion's <clears throat> and mine had once boasted to me that he frequently hired these donut shop girls to pose for him. He'd always offered to show me the pictures he'd taken, but he never seemed to get around to it. I could only assume he was fibbing wishfully, or else he'd shoved all the photos into a shoebox he kept under his bed 
and took out to drool over on rainy nights. And who could blame him? Polish girls managed to ooze and withhold sex simultaneously. They dressed for mass and grocery shopping alike in slippery little cleavagey mini dresses, sheer hose and stilettos. It was really fun to write about a guy lusting after women, as a straight woman, I have to say. <laughs> <clears throat> they smelled of some pheromonal perfume only they seemed to have access to. Their bodies were at once, so at once soft and tight, breasty and rumpy, but willow-waisted and slender-armed, and long-legged like some idealized doll. They seemed totally removed from the effect they had on men. They didn't flirt, didn't acknowledge or encourage our stares. In fact, they seemed to be unaware of us, as if they put that dress on by accident, as if they looked and smelled like that through no effort or design of their own. And they wore their disdainful expressions on faces as comically gorgeous as cartoon vixens, with peachy skin, curved lips, ski-jumped noses, and heavy-lidded heavy eyes of a dizzying mad blue. The guy next to me was muttering under his breath, something in Polish I didn't catch, but that was not, I was guessing, his mother's recipe for stuffed cabbage. And he was shifting on his stool in a way that made my hackles rise. If he had taken a dislike to me, he was welcome to it, as long as he kept it to himself. Feeling a little better than I had been 15 minutes before, cheered by the donut girl and sugar and grease and the warmth of this little place and the rumbling, incipient violence to my left, I finished my cruller and began on my chocolate donut. I motioned to the girl and then to my coffee cup, Without appearing to exert the slightest effort, she was before me in a flash with the pot pouring. I looked up at her and smiled. Thank you, I said. You are incredibly beautiful. The man on my left gave a volcanic shudder. The girl looked at him, then went back to the cash register. Then everything happened very fast. The man said something to me in Polish, something brief and savage, a snarl and a hot gust of vodka fumes. I turned to tell him I didn't speak Polish. But as my neck swiveled, he punched me in the ear. I dropped my donut. The girl shrieked and clapped her hands to her cheeks. Her counterpart in the back of the room called to someone in the kitchen. I rubbed my ear, puzzled and slow to understand. My fingers came away without any blood on them, thank God, but there was a high ringing sound in there. The Polish drunk, seeing that I needed elucidation, punched me again, this time in the side of the head, missing my ear. My vision went black and then cleared. I stood up and launched myself at him and got his thick bricklayer's neck in a chokehold and squeezed my thumbs against his Adam's apple. Bastard, I said between clenched teeth. I stared into his ice-hot blue little eyes. Then I spat at him. I was a malnourished string bean of a poet eligible for AARP membership. He was a youngish man who looked as if he spent half his time at the Odom Gym on Callier Street pumping iron and the other half drinking lethal grade hooch in McCarran Park on a bench. It was not going to be a fair fight, but it felt good to pretend to myself as he gathered his forces to kill me that I was impressing the donut girls. Then he struck. One meaty hand squeezed both of my bony ones, convincing me to release my grip on his windpipe. The other meaty hand punched me full in the face and picked up the metal napkin dispenser and slapped it into my eye. I was pulled off him by someone very firm and purposeful, and then my enemy and I were both in handcuffs, being led out of the donut shop by two cops who clearly would have preferred to stay there all day. My nose was streaming blood, my eye throbbed, adrenaline and pride prevented anything from hurting yet, but this was going to be a bitch. The Polish drunk must have been the donut girl's much older boyfriend, or her uncle or father, or a friend of her uncle or father, or a friend of her boyfriend's. Whoever he was, he hadn't liked that look on my face one bit. Well, it was gone. Thank you all. And now I'd like to introduce the first pair of readers, um, mentee and mentor. First of all, I'd like to say hi to all the readers. Hi, everyone. <laughs> Welcome and thank you for having me. And, and once again, thank you so much for having me. Um, the first pair of readers are a mentee and mentor, Megan McCullough and Heather Kristen. And I will turn the mic over to you. <laughs> 